can do anything. Let's just trust him that God can work in every one of our situations today. Let's just trust him a little bit today. In Jesus' name, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for all your wonderful blessings. Lord Jesus, we're so undeserved. Oh, God, I'm so thankful. Lord Jesus, touch every heart, every mind, every soul, oh, God. Help us, oh, God, to be sincere. smile at so if you're sitting by your husband or your wife go ahead and smile at them and uh, tell them you love them and uh, you can be seated we are in uh, the fourth lesson in our Sunday school discipleship uh, curriculum for this quarter and um, we are trying to reflect the character of God. That's what our that's what our theme is for this quarter. My voice is not uh, real strong today. I preached yesterday at a little church in Delphi and the monitors didn't work or something and uh, I couldn't hear myself and they had they had suppressors on the microphone on the microphone so in the sound system, you can get a, a thing called a suppressor, and every time you, it gets to where it's going to peak, it kicks it back out. And so I'd be talking, and come back, and it'd be like this. Come back, and it'd be like this. Yeah. It, thank you, Zane, for not putting suppressors in ours, and thank you for good monitors. I'm standing here, and I can hear myself. And uh, so I pushed with my throat probably a little harder last night than what I normally do because I couldn't hear myself and I was I thought I was preaching real good and I was afraid everybody else wouldn't be able to hear me preach real good <laughs> so I wanted to make sure they heard me so I hollered a lot <clears throat> we're talking about today we're going to talk about patient endurance the Lord is getting ready to come with everything that's going on in the world I don't know how anybody who says they're a Christian could not believe that the Lord is getting ready to come. And the Bible talks to us, there are parables, a couple of parables that Jesus taught specifically about uh, enduring. Um, life is not a speed race, life is an endurance race. Uh, we're going to have to endure to the end. That doesn't mean living for God is not enjoyable. That doesn't mean that living for God is not fun, but what it does mean is, is that there are trials and things that come along uh, in our life that uh, we've got to endure through. We've got to go through them. I think a lot of times people have trouble, and I'm going to try to hit the lesson. I am going to try to hit the lesson. I think there are a lot of times people have trouble living for God because whenever a problem comes, they want God to deliver them out of that problem, and he never promised that he'd deliver us out of every trial. He promised us that he would take us through that trial, through it, through that trial. I, you can tell my throat's just about gone, y'all. There's a story in in my lesson. I don't know if you get my the stories that I get. I really haven't looked at the student books much, but Daniel Seagraves is a prolific uh Pentecostal author and teacher. He teaches at Urshan and uh, ABI, and um, he is uh, and and uh, uh, Christian Life College on the West Coast. He co he teaches a class at just about all three of those. Uh, his grandfather was L. D. Seagraves. He was one of the first Pente Pentecostal preachers in their family, and Brother Seagraves said that for years. Uh, he wondered about, so the United Pentecostal Church, which we're affiliated with, a lot of, uh, but the United Pentecostal Church became an organization in 1945. There were two oneness 
uh, groups that merged in 1945. And if you're a licensed minister, you ever go to a conference or you ever hear uh, preachers talk, sometimes you'll hear them talk about the merger. And uh, the merger happened in 1945 when, when these two uh, organizations uh, merged. The Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ merged with the Pentecostal Church Incorporated, and that became the United Pentecostal Church International. Um, Brother Seagraves always wondered before the merger in 1945 what his dad was affiliated with, what had happened. They came across some documents that told him, and uh, one of the documents that they found was his grandfather's ordination certificate, um, and uh, he was in a church called the Church of Jesus Christ, and the church certificate, ordination certificate, was dated March 31st, 1937, so his grandpa was about 50 years old. The, the Church of Jesus Christ focused heavily on the name of Jesus Christ. Before the merger of 1945, if you were affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ, the name Jesus Christ had to be in your church name somewhere. So if we were in the Church of Jesus Christ, we would be have to be the Lawrence Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. The name was important to them, and it had to be in there somewhere, just little details. So um, Brother Seagraves' father pastored in Kennett, Missouri in 1943, and during a tent revival in 1948, there were 223 people that were baptized in Jesus' name, and 150 people received the Holy Ghost in a tent revival. In Kennett, Missouri, way out, Kennett's way out in the boondocks, uh, uh, at the boot heel, uh, right there at the boot heel there in that in that area, and uh, there have been several since then evangelists and missionaries and pastors that uh, came from the Kennett Church. Um, when his grandfather was there, the church affiliated with the United Pentecostal Church, and. Um, one Sunday afternoon, or on, I'm sorry, on Sunday afternoons, they sponsored a radio broadcast, and they did a live radio broadcast. When I was a kid, the church that I went to, we had a live radio broadcast, and uh, uh, the sound man would sit on the platform with headphones in. Wayne Turner would sit on the platform with headphones on and a little bitty thing, tuner, that he would tune everything in. And he'd point, and we'd go live, and the choir would be singing. And uh, then we'd sing a congregational song, and Brother Wright would preach for 15 minutes or so on the radio. On uh, I can't remember what the name of the radio station was, but it's funny when you get older, all the things you remember when you were a little kid. And I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. But Brother Seagraves was on this local radio station, and um, one of the songs that they sang was, we're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. Spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Uh, Brother Seagraves would almost every week preach on the radio that you have to be baptized in Jesus' name. And you can't find in Scripture one place where anybody was ever baptized any way other than then in the name of Jesus Christ. And Brother Seagraves would say, if you can show me somewhere in the New Testament where somebody was baptized other than in the name of Jesus Christ, I'll give you my farm and the keys to my Studebaker. And the uh, reason I'm telling you that, uh, or Brother Seagraves said the reason that he's telling that is not only because he liked talking about his grandpa, but also because that's, brought about an important lesson in patience. According to the family story that was passed down, there was a woman in the church that went to old Brother Seagraves one day and said, Brother Seagraves, please pray for me that God will give me patience. And old Brother Seagraves, old-time Pentecostal preacher, old-fashioned Pentecostal preacher, he put his hand on her head and he said, God, I pray that you would send this woman tribulation. And she said, that's not what I want, Brother Seagraves. I want patience. And he responded, Sister, the Bible says in Romans 5 and 3 that tribulation brings patience. 
So old Brother Seagraves, he was a wonderful preacher. Sister Hunt used to tell you, oh, don't pray for patience. Tribulation brings patience. The Bible doesn't say tribulation brings patience. It's what works patience in us. Uh, Granny used to also say don't make fun of people with big ears and big feet because when you have kids, they'll have big ears and big feet. So she was always very worried that we didn't do and say the wrong thing. But uh, Brother Daniel Seagrave said one of his favorite lines about talking about his grandpa is telling about the fact that his grandpa said, if you can find anywhere in Scripture where anybody was baptized any other way than the name of Jesus, I'll give you the keys to my Studebaker and my and the family farm. And uh, Brother Seagrave said, the farm is still in the family's name. Thank God. So, endurance, patience, it's important, especially when we're going to walk with God. I saw 20 years ago, you didn't preach about Facebook, and I'm not, I don't preach about Facebook, but there are some things on Facebook every once in a while that make good sense. Most of the junk on there don't make no sense. But every once in a while I see something, I saw a little meme on Facebook this week that said, don't leave church because of people, because people aren't the reason why you came to church in the first place. That makes good sense to me. So we've got to learn that if we're going to walk with God, we've got to have patience. One of the great parables in the New Testament is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And uh, it's what is uh, selected uh, as our main theme. James said this, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So this the, the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins is found in the book of Matthew. And um, if we look at Scripture and we look at Matthew 24 and two prominent verses in that chapter, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And then in verse 44, he said, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We get caught up in the business of going to church and being the church and doing church that sometimes we forget that this is all about being ready when the Lord comes. This is all about making sure that we're ready. Living for God is a process. Walking with God is a growth process. We grow in God. Some of us grow faster than others. Some of us think we grow faster than others. But we grow in God. We're not perfect. So that's one of the reasons why we have to learn patience is because we look at other people who we think have it all together and we don't have it all together and we wonder how long is it going to take for God to make me into what he wants me to be and we've got to learn to patiently wait on God. Um, if we look at scripture we see Matthew the Bible said watch therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the son of man cometh. So if we're going to grasp the significance of that warning, we've got to have some familiarity with what it's really talking about in Matthew 24 and 25. And what it's really talking about is the marriage customs of Jewish people. Marriage customs in biblical times was much different than it is today. Um, it, it was different dramatically from the Western world. Uh, to underline that point in this lesson, the importance of patience and patient endurance, these ancient customs extended the time frame of marriage beyond what we talk about in the day we live in. Marriage celebration often lasted for, for a week. The marriage celebration itself would last an entire week. And the groom made a marriage contract with his bride's father. In, in English-speaking nations today, it's generally accepted that the first step towards marriage is engagement. For the Jews, it was called betrothal, and it was more binding than it was an engagement. I was engaged twice before I met my wife. 
Now, to, to soften the blow, I told her I was looking for her all my life, and I thought I found her twice, but I realized I was wrong. Um, people told her he'll never go through with it uh, because it's just an engagement. You know, I, my, the second girl I was engaged to, uh, some of you may leave the church today after I tell you these stories and may never come back. Second girl I was engaged to, we sat down and put our wedding invitations in the mail, wrote them out, put them in the mail. I left her house from filling them out and dropped them in the mailbox. And when I dropped those wedding invitations in the mailbox, my heart stopped beating. Not because I was so excited about getting married, because I thought, oh my God, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with that girl. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, I can't marry her. And mom said, whatever you do, don't put those wedding invitations in the mail. (laughs) I said, guess what, mommy? (laughs) That's why I'm calling you. I just did. Oh, my God, Terry. Can't tell you how many times in my life I heard that. Oh, my God, Terry. So we figured out what we had to do, and then I went back home, and I talked to my former pastor when I was a kid, and he said, well, you're going to have to go to her pastor, and you're going to have to tell that pastor that you'll apologize to the whole church for embarrassing that girl. I said, I got to do that? He said, that's what you're going to have to do. So I went to that pastor, and I said, Brother Miller said that if I need to, I will apologize to the whole church for embarrassing her, and he said, son, I think what you need to do is go home and never come back here. And I said, thank you, sir. And I went home, and I never went back there. But it was just an engagement. No big deal, right? didn't matter that I broke that poor girl's heart. She was going to get to live the rest of her life with me. (laughs) But it was different in the Bible. It was different in the Bible. They were betrothed, and, and, and that betrothal was a binding. It was the first step. In the ancient Near East, a young man's parents often selected the wife that he would have. And sometimes he was allowed to make the choice. But most of the time, it was a family uh, contract that was made. And the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins doesn't indicate how the choice of the bride was made, but that the but the betrothal had taken place. And it really doesn't matter. There, there were three gifts that were commonly exchanged. The first was the mehar, or a compensation gift from the bridegroom to the family of the bride. He bought her. Give her two donkeys and a, and a sheep. I'll give you two donkeys and a sheep for your daughter. If you'll let me marry your daughter, I think she's worth two donkeys and a sheep. That's the truth, folks. And it sealed the covenant, and it bound those two families together. The next gift was the dowry, and that was the gift to the bride, typically to the bride or to the groom from her father. And the third was the bridegroom's gift to the bride. And the bride, the groom returned to his home once everything was established and set, and he would prepare a place for his bride to live. Sometimes it could take as long as a year before he could come back and get her. And there's a period of time between the betrothal and the marriage itself. (coughs) And that's the central point of the parable in Matthew 24 and 25. The Bible said that while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So listen, the problem here was not them slumbering and sleeping. We've made a big deal about the fact that they slept and slumbered wasn't the issue. Uh, It could take a week. It could take a month. It could take a year. They have to sleep. They had to sleep. While the bridegroom was away, they all slumbered and slept. The problem, it it was something that was to be expected. It's not a rebuke. It was just an observation. The wise slept just like the foolish slept. All ten of the virgins slept. They didn't know when the bridegroom would come back. That the typical time period between the betrothal and when they'd actually get get married required that they spend some time in sleeping. 
The difference is the wisdom of the five virgins in their decision to bring extra oil for their lamps so that their lamps wouldn't be burned out. The foolish virgins assumed that they wouldn't need they wouldn't need any extra oil. There, I don't believe, you know, I've studied it and tried to figure it out and tried to figure out a way to preach on it. I don't really believe there's any significance in the fact that it was extra oil. I don't think it was a special anointing that they had. I don't think it was that they uh, were any better. I just think that they prepared to wait. What's important is the oil had to be there. The, the lamps were part of the wedding ceremony, and there had to be oil in the lamps for the wedding to take place, and they were prepared to wait. They that wait upon the Lord, Isaiah said, those are the ones that will renew their strength. They are the ones that will mount up with wings as eagles and not be weary. So I think the significance of this is not that they slumbered and slept because they all had to sleep, not that they had extra oil and there's a power in their oil. I think the significance in the story of the ten virgins is five of them were wise enough to prepare to wait on the bridegroom to return. The wisdom of those five is what's important. Watch, therefore, Jesus said, for ye know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. The wise virgins were prepared to wait patiently. They were prepared to patiently endure. The foolish virgins were not ready for the Lord to come back. Their lack of preparation indicates that they had a lack of patience. They just assumed that he would come because now they were ready today. I've got to be ready every day. So the groom came back <coughs> so that he could consummate his marriage. The ten virgins functioned, if you will, as roles of bridesmaids in this thing. In the parable, they're not the bride. They're not the bride in the parable. They are, they are the bridemaid. They were to accompany the bridegroom who had his own male companions to the wedding. One of the bridegroom's companion, the friend of the bridegroom, served in somewhat of, of, of today's role as the best man. Jesus, it's a parable. So it's a story within a story. Jesus used common things to the Hebrew people to express ideas about spiritual things. Jesus used natural stories to bring about a spiritual enlightenment. It's the parable of the ten virgins. It's the parable of the five wise and the five foolish. Jesus is the bridegroom. It's clear that he's the bridegroom. The bridegroom represents the Son of Man. John said it. John the Baptist said it. Uh, when they asked him, who it was and what it was all about. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John said Jesus is the bridegroom, and he's coming after his bride. The preparation of our uh, salvation is what makes us ready. We've been given the gift from the bridegroom. We've been given the gift. John the Baptist said he was the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. Jesus, not only did John the Baptist say it, but Jesus said it. He said, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and, they will fa and, and, and then they will fast. Jesus represents in this story everything the bridegroom represented. 
Jesus' betrothal to us, if you will, and then the going away. The bridegroom would leave for a time and go to prepare the place where his bride would live. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there ye may be also. So he, he's gone away to prepare a place for us. It's imperative that we understand that there needs to be a patience in our waiting for him. We cannot lose sight of the fact that the bridegroom's coming back. I'm going to have a hard time preaching this morning in morning worship. I can, I can feel it. So uh, it, in, bear with me when my voice is like this when I'm preaching. All right? <clears throat> Jesus is that bridegroom. So if he's the bridegroom, then obviously the church is the bride, right? Paul said that. Paul said it in um, Ephesians 5.22. He said when he addressed the proper relationship between husbands and wives, he said it's a great mystery, but I also speak of Christ, concerning Christ and his church as the bridegroom and the bride. Marriage represents the relationship between Jesus and his church. Everything about God's relationship with us can be found in a proper relationship in the physical sense because we were created in the image of God. And so then, that lays us a great foundation for us to understand that everything, I can say this uh, in a parable, everything that does not follow God's plan for marriage is outside of it of God's plan, it becomes an abomination. You with me? Uh, God never intended for people to shack up. God never intended, I just might as well go ahead and say it, God never intended for men to be with men and women to be with women. God didn't make us that way. Uh, God has a plan and in the physical sense, we, we teach, you're, if you don't, you should, you hear me? If you don't, you should teach your children that if it's worth having, it's worth waiting for. If something's worth having, it's worth waiting for. And so a relationship between a husband and wife is worth having it's worth waiting until you're a husband and a wife to have that relationship. I'm in the adult class. Do I need to get any plainer? All right. And that's our responsibility to teach our children. Patience is important in relationship. It's important in relationship. My wife and I get along a lot better now than we did when we were young. You know why? Because we have learned that we can be patient with one another, and sooner or later I can buckle her down and bend her to my way of thinking. She's not in here, is she? <laughs> We've learned. This is who I am. That's who she is. And we're going to have to learn to be patient sometimes. I don't always come around to her ideas as quickly as she wants me to. She doesn't always come around to my ideas as quickly uh, either. But we've learned that patience will help us to endure the problems that we go through and the trials that we go through in our relationship. We've got to learn to be ready, always ready, but patient, waiting on the coming of the Lord. So the church is the bride. Paul said it. And then the, we've, we've got to look at the idea of, 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 of what, what all that says for us. Paul said, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul said, this gospel prepares us to be the bride of Christ. And so we've got to allow, you don't get the gospel and not change. You don't get salvation and not change. 
When you're baptized, you're baptized into Christ. You become a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Everything about me is new. I have a new relationship. When I got married, I quickly learned that I couldn't go out on Friday nights and hang out with the boys. That got me into trouble. Took me places I didn't want to go. Kept me there longer than I wanted to stay. Got me in trouble when I got home. Same way it is. I said this last week. I've been dwelling. I don't know why, but I just have been dwelling on this a lot the last couple of weeks, even in my mind and in my prayer. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And so there's got to be a preparation in our lives. We've got to we've got to be patient in our walk with God and we've got to endure sound doctrine and endure hard tribulation. We've got to learn to be patient in our walk with God. We've got to prepare that we've got to live we've got to live like he's never coming back and expect that he could come back any minute. So I've got to, if I'm going to make it to heaven, you know, I've got to make some changes. That I've got to do some things. There's some preparation for me in order for me to be the bride. There is some preparation. Paul said, I have given you everything that you need so that you can be espoused and that you can be exactly what God wants you to be. Because the church is the bride. And we're going to a new city. There's an abundance of biblical evidence that identifies Jesus not only as a bridegroom, but as a lamb of God. Uh, I could give you scripture after scripture after scripture that tells us that he is the lamb of God. John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. <clears throat> Revelation, he's the lamb of God. On and on and on and on and on. Peter said he was the lamb of God. So the marriage of the lamb, whose, lot, whose wife has made herself ready, refers to to the consummation of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. Scripture draws towards the conclusion with the descent of the new Jerusalem, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In the midst of the vision that John had, an angel came to him and said, Come, and I will show you the bride, in Revelation 21 and 9, the Lamb's wife. The Lamb's wife. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and the church is his bride. And John was carried away in the spirit, and there was a vision that was given to him. And where he was shown the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. But that's not the last reference to the bride. Five verses later, from the end of the written revelation, we read, And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come, and let him who is a thirst come. Whoever desires, let him take the waters of life freely. So as time concludes and eternity is introduced and the church is caught away, the bride of Christ, the church, joins with him to an invitation to that, to that marriage feast. We are the bride of Christ. And so this lesson, while not uh, shouting material, maybe, and while not, whoo, pastor, that's the best lesson you've ever taught material, it teaches us that as the bride, we have to make ourselves ready. And we have to be patient and wait. Patient endurance is necessary. The Bible says in James 5, 7, and 8, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earthly, the early and the latter rain. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You don't have to be the first out of the gate. You don't have to be the fastest in the race. You just have to make up your mind that you're going to hold on until the Lord comes. 
Patient endurance is what is important in our walk with God. James reminds his readers that when a farmer plants a seed, he waits patiently for it to grow and to produce. He can't do anything to hasten the harvest. Spring and autumn rains have to fall before the crop can mature. Once the farmer has done everything that he can do, and what he does is plants the seed, he's got to wait for it to produce results. You can't do anything to make the seed grow faster. Your job is to plant seed. God's job is to make the seed grow. And your job is to wait patiently while it grows. Some folks don't grow as fast as, I, as the pastor would like them to grow. Some folks get a little too big for their britches. Some folks don't grow as fast as past the pastor would like them to grow. But it's not my job. And there's nothing I can do to make the seed. I can pray for more rain. And I can pray for God to make the soil more fertile. And I can pray to keep the, the bugs and the, and the varmints out of the garden. But I can't make the seed grow faster. But I have to plant seed. And I've got to plant seed that is, has the ability to grow. So I can't plant the seed hastily. I've got to make sure that the ground around it is ripe. That's my job. That's your job. And the reason for patience, the reason why we've got to be patient is because the coming of the Lord is near. The first century church lived believing that the Lord was going to come any time. And since God doesn't reveal the time of the event, believers of all ages have anticipated the day that the Lord would come. We see scripture that points to when the Lord would come. And um, when, when Adolf Hitler rose to power, they were sure Hitler was the Antichrist. Uh, when uh, the guy with the big scar on his head in, in, Rus in the Soviet Union, what was his name? Gorbachev. They were sure Gorbachev because he had the mark, man. He had the mark on his head. Some guy wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Was Going to Return in 88. In the year 2000, people were sure the Lord was going to come because computers couldn't work and phones were going to shut down and the world was going to end and lights were going off and Refrigerators were going to stop working and food would ruin and surely the Lord was coming back. And there have always been events that have made us think the Lord is getting ready to return. But every day that he does not come gets us one day closer to when he is. And he is coming back. And with everything that's going on in the world today, I cannot see how the imminent return of the Lord can be far away. The five wise virgins had the joy of participating in the bridegroom's wedding. They were prepared to wait however long it took for him to arrive. Patience is a valuable virtue. Only people that endure are going to receive God's promise. Only those that endure are going to receive the promise. If we are willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the lamb. If we faint not, we'll be ready. So the lesson this morning, stand with me, I'm done. The lesson this morning teaches us that while we get so busy with programs and all of the stuff that's going on, and uh, we, we, can, we can get so busy about church that we get more involved with having good church service than re remembering why we want to have good church. Our, our view of good church uh, gets a little skewed. You know, we think if the choir or the worship team sings and people shout and we uh, dance around, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I would rather our church be that way every, di every day. I'd like it if people would get out of their seats and come up and push up against the wall and just be sitting in their seats like a bunch of old canned tuna. 
we'd have better church if we get out of our seats and worship God a little bit than sitting around like we're a piece of canned tuna. I just throw that out there for you. Uh, and, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. We need to be excited and enjoy church. But good church is when, really, is when we're performing what God wants us to perform, and that's when we're seeing souls born into the kingdom of God. That's when we really have good church. When somebody repents of their sins, that's good church. When somebody's baptized in water, that's good church. When somebody receives the Holy Ghost, that's good church. When somebody realizes the Lord is coming back for them and I've got to be ready when he comes, that's good church. But we get so caught up in the preparation of the wedding that we forget that the bridegroom's coming to take the bride away. Take the bride away. Hardest thing my wife, I think, on my wife with our kids getting married is them leaving the house and her not being able to tell them when they could come in, when they could go, what they could do, how they could spend their money, what they could and couldn't do. Dads are wired different. Uh, Brother Odell, I was just glad they were leaving. Four, three, two, one, blast off. Not my wife. My wife is still concerned. Sometimes I have to tell her, you know what? They're going to they're gonna have to make decisions. They're going to make mistakes, and they're going to have to learn. And you're not always going to be there to bail them out. And I'm tired of spending all my money bailing them out. Um, because she was so caught up for so long and doing all the preparation. You know, we should spend our lives preparing them so that when it's time for them to come into the world, that's the plan. That's why God gives children to adults. That's why it's not God's plan that children bear children. So that the adults can prepare them for the time when they launch on their own. That's what our spiritual life here is all about. We're here to prepare us for the return of the Lord. And when he comes back, we get the reward of a life well lived. That preparation time. So we need to make sure that we're patient in our walk with God. They that wait upon the Lord, those are the ones that are going to have their, their strength renewed. We gotta walk with God every day. We gotta walk with God. We gotta live for God. We gotta make sure, sure we do, we have to make sure there's oil in our lamps. Sure we do. We have to be wise in, in our preparation. But we've got to understand we are the bride. We're not the five virgins. We're the bride. We're the bride. And we've got to endure and wait until the day when the Lord comes back for us. And we've got to be ready when he comes. That's why it's important that we let the Holy Ghost work in our lives and change us and make us what God wants us to be. Amen. It's about 12 minutes till. We're going to take 12 minutes to do whatever it is you got to do. And we will start morning worship right at 11. God bless you.